Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here. You guys know what time it is. Time to talk about current events in the online fitness community. And for those of you who like these type of videos, please remember to click like down below to offset those dislikes. But today, I'm going to discuss a video that was linked to me by Jeremy Ether discussing perfect science-based dumbbell bicep workouts. Um, it's going to be one of those cases I'm going to be critical of what Jeremy is doing here and what he's saying not because he's, he's a bad person or I dislike what he's doing in any way because I don't. I, I think the kid has a lot of potential. I think one day he will actually be a legitimate source of good information. Uh, I know his channel is blown up, but right now, uh, a lot of what he's promoting, because he is himself still, still a novice lifter, um, he has a lot to learn about training. He's passionate about it, obviously. He cares about it, obviously. He's building a large audience. But a lot of it's not particularly good information, and it's kind of done under the guise of being science-based. Now, some of it is actually really good, and I've said that before. When he's put out some good stuff, I always give credit for that. I'm like, hey, this is actually pretty good. I like this, right? Uh, I'm fair in these sort of things. I'm fair in these sort of things. You have to be fair. You have to be unbiased in, in reviewing stuff like that. The problem we have, though, is that he did one looking at EMGs and dumbbells. And first of all, people need to understand some stuff. EMGs are not accurate enough to do what he's trying to do with the EMGs. I always read the EMG studies. I want to make that clear. Even though I admit they have very serious limitations as far as, as training applications go, I still look at them. They're still interesting. Every single EMG study that he discusses, I've read years ago already. Uh, I'm intimately familiar with them. I, I look at them. They're interesting to me as someone in the strength and conditioning world. They're interesting. But you have to take them very, very lightly. You have to take them lightly. Um, and the problem we have is, is multifold in nature. Number one, um, he wants to, he focuses way more on EMG data than he does on actual biomechanics or understanding training programming in the stress recovery adaptation cycle, um, understanding training volume, training loads, programming. Those are the things that matter, and that's stuff that you, you learn in the real world. It's not studied heavily and studied. It, it's studied in the real world and athletes over decades and decades of compiling data from all the top coaches in the world of how to actually program this stuff. Um, usually, the research looking at that is usually 50 years behind. You say, what? Yeah, usually a, a method doesn't get put into a study for 30 to 50 years until after it's already been implemented by 500 or 1,000 champions already in various strength sports and, and strength and conditioning world. And so they're just now starting to study stuff from the 70s and 80s. It doesn't make it into studies, uh, unfortunately. So we get over to the point of the problem with some of the EMG, is that he takes a bunch of dumbbell exercises and says, oh, we're looking at this one because it did better and better and better on this here. The problem is that the margin of error on an EMG study is as great as the, the difference between all those exercises. In other words, if I look at like the seven exercises he has with the different dumbbells for the biceps, if I look at those, to me, they're all equally good. You say, what? Those variations you're seeing, those minor variations are within a margin of error for determining uh, the response and muscle fiber response in an EMG, okay? Therefore, because they're all within the same margin of error of each other, those exercises are all pretty much equal. So you can't look at that chart of like those seven exercises and say one is better than the other for, for bicep activation. That's the problem. That's the problem. They're all equal. So, a, a scientific approach, someone who looks at it and understands the science, would say, hey, you could pick anything out of those seven. They're all pretty good bicep exercises. The other thing he, he doesn't factor in is function and he doesn't understand the training in because you notice that he left out all the multi-joint exercises. He only looked at elbow hinge, right? Ones, ones that work off of the elbow only. That's all he looked at. Well, that's not even using the EMGs because what beats curls on an EMG? Like if, we, if you were to compile the EMG studies, which two exercises beat every single curl on his list? The underhand grip chin up and the neutral grip chin up. Now, even the overhand grip chin up beats some of them when you go look at the study. It actually beats a lot of types of curls. The full pronated grip overhand. But the hammer grip, 
particularly the, the narrower and the chin-up, actually beats curls on EMG data. So if we're going to talk about EMG data being the be-all, end-all, it should be chin-ups. Chin-ups would be your best exercise. That's what should be mentioned up front before he gets to any of this other stuff. Now there's a problem with that, isn't there? Before people say, Jason, you're only promoting compounds, I do curls. I do curls twice a week on camera. I vlog all my training. I'm a power lifter, but I do curls because they improve your bench press. We can get into that later. So before people jump up and try to claim you're just giving the power lifting bias and telling people not to do curls, I do curls. So so let's let's get that out of the way first of all. I do curls for a reason, because I understand programming. So Here's your other problem. He's getting all caught up in the short head and the long head. And it's like, well, when you look at the concentration curl that locks the arm into place, right, so that you can't move the shoulder, it really puts a focus on the short head. It puts a focus on the short head because it removes the long head. Right? And you can't do that. The, the, what you do not want to do with a small, uncomplicated muscle like the bicep is remove heads of the muscle, like reduce their effectiveness. People say, what do you mean? Because the long head doesn't work purely off the hinge of the elbow. It works off of shoulder extension also. So by removing the shoulder extension component, now granted, it does, it is affected by that also. It is affected by it. But because part of its function is also the shoulder movement, any curl in which you are completely locked into your shoulder doesn't move forward actually has less total bicep activation. And I'm sorry, but let's be realistic here. Any of you kids who are out there seeking to maximize the size of your biceps, if that's an important goal to you, now don't get me wrong, I, I think that that's silly personally to, to be obsessed over a muscle like the biceps, but I'm, I am approaching that from an athlete's perspective. Because bigger biceps do improve your bench press, which is why I do them. But, if that was your goal, why wouldn't you want to make the whole bicep as big as possible? Like, why would you stand there and say, no, I only want three quarters of my bicep to grow, and I want about a fourth of my bicep to get minimal stimulation somehow. If I could find a way to do it, because it does attach to two points, and one of those heads is involved with that travel, and the other one isn't because of where it inserts up here in the shoulder, why would you say, I, I want to give my bicep less total stimulation? That doesn't make sense. That's silly. That's silly. Make the whole thing grow. And if you're worried about your peak, well, number one, that's genetic. Number two, that's largely affected by the brachialis, a smaller muscle down here. Now, for me as a power lifter, I do hammer curls. People say, why? Because the EMG studies show usually the hammer curl works the whole bicep just as much. But it also works the brachialis and radial brachialis up here more. So why does that matter? Because I need bigger arms as a power lifter. I'm not concerned about just the bicep. I want my whole arm to be big. And if I build all of that area, why do we care? Because when you're at the bottom of a bench, it gives you meat to press against to help spring you out of the bottom and give you five more pounds on your bench press. Right? Bigger bicep, brachialis, radial brachialis, they can press against each other. If you can build that area right there, it compresses against it and it can create just a little bit of extra force at the hardest part of the bench. How it gets you started. It's very small. That's a very, very small benefit. But it's helpful and it gives you more stability around the elbow. You're less likely to have elbow issues mentioned so that's why we care about it but I want all of it big right? I don't want this to grow I want this to grow this this and this now granted I don't have the best arm genetics in the world and we all know that it's often often a joke I have to work really hard to gain anything in my arms but to come over to the point with all this so why do curls at all why not just do tons of pull-ups Jason because from a programming end this is this is the point we make You'll gain more size overall, including even biceps, by focusing on the big lifts. All right, that, that's a fact. That is a fact. The problem is that we deal with total recoverable volume. Weak guys don't need to worry about this. If you're a noob, man, you can come and do tons of chin-ups. You'll be fine. Your biceps will grow. As you get more advanced, as we get more advanced, what happens? 
we start finding that things like our total recovery, we can't come in and do 20 sets of chin-ups sometimes every week. Our back recovery can't handle it. Our total body recovery is impacted by it. If we do too many pull-ups and chin-ups, we can't deadlift as many sets every week. That becomes a problem. And oftentimes what we find is that for many, many people out there, their biceps can handle more total weekly volume than what they can recover from for upper and middle back exercises. Therefore, throwing in some curls to give additional stimulation would be a pretty good idea. Now, me personally, let's come over to the other point. There's tendonitis, there's overuse to consider. Smaller exercises will cause inflammation if you are not careful if they're used excessively. You need to use big movements first, and then you fill in the gaps with the smaller exercises, the gaps in your training volume with smaller exercises, such as curls. I personally can't do the underhand grip stuff. I'm in my 40s. I get tendonitis issues from it. A lot of you younger kids are going to learn this the harder than you do. There's going to be movement patterns you will not be able to do indefinitely. And that's okay. We work around those things. So in my case, another reason I do the hammer curls. I do all my rowing, overhand grip. It's a reason for that. Easier to recover from in terms of connective tissue. But... We're dealing with, with training economy and training volume. So yes, it's a good idea to do some curls, but to think that you need four different sorts of curls or that that is the foundation of your bicep growth instead of a secondary stimulus, that's, that's silly, that's bad programming. Furthermore, let's come over to the point, if we know all those exercises are roughly equal, You're just there to fill in training fatigue and extra training volume for your biceps. And even if they weren't equal, would it matter? From a programming end, if you legitimately had one specific sort of bicep curl that caused 10% more activation of the bicep, wouldn't that mean the bicep fatigues less from it? Yes. That means you could probably do one more rep with the same weight. And if you did one more rep with the same weight, guess what would happen? you get the same growth response. Hopefully that's clicking for, for people. It, it actually, it doesn't matter. It's gonna be about how many quality reps and quality contraction you get and then how much you fatigue the, all the parts of the bicep. And then do you recover from it, right? That's understanding the science of training programming, not I've got an EMG that shows that this exercise activates this head hypothetically 7% more due to the electrodes that are measuring electro, electrical response because the fatigue is cumulative from the reps. When a muscle reaches failure, it reaches failure. What matters at that point is the biomechanics of maybe certain fibers couldn't be activated because you didn't initiate the movement pattern in which they are initiated, such as the raising the shoulder part. Right? All right, guys, but that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative, and I will talk to you guys next time.